1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to start off on verse 17. I want to talk to you on communion this morning since uh, it is communion Sunday. And maybe um, a lot of the information that I'll be sharing, it's already been preached before. But like uh, Paul says, to repeat the same things over to you is no problem to me. Amen. Amen. And it's good to he hear things again because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Amen. <clears throat> so verse 17 says, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there is division among you, and partly I believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifested among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not eating the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not a house to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you. That the Lord Jesus the same night which he was betrayed. When he had taken thank, given thanks. The same night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat the bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Father, we thank you for your word because it does not return void to us. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. Father, we just praise you. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, I want to talk to you on communion and there's a... Uh, Three little, little things that I want to touch on. Uh, first, I want to touch on the finished communion and the finished work of Jesus. Uh, I want to also talk on, on two ways to take it unworthily. Okay, there's two ways to take it un unworthily. So the first thing I, I want to touch on is communion and the finished work. See, because when Jesus uh, came and... and and, and took bread and wine. What he's declaring is the wine is my body that's going to be shed for you. The, the bread is my body that is broken up for you. And this is dealing with the work that Jesus did on the cross. Amen. And, and we need to understand that that work is a finished work. It's not something that, uh, that uh, he has to do over and over and over again. It is complete. It is done. Uh, I, I, 
I taught a series at one time uh, on the, the finished work of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit, the present day work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that you need to realize, you need to believe that the work that Jesus did on the cross is finished so that the Holy Spirit can perform it in your life. Let me say that again. You need to believe that the work that Jesus did on the cross, it is a finished work so that the Holy Spirit can perform it in your life. If you are not believing that the work that Jesus did on the cross is a finished work, the Holy Spirit will never be able to perform it in your life. Amen? What is the finished work of Jesus? That he, that he dealt with sin, and that sin is done and over once and for all. So I want us to go to chapter 10 of Hebrews. And we're going to read portions of it, uh, because I want to express something there. Now I want you to, starting at verse 1, it says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come... And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now, this is what I want you to understand. In the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, it's written to the Hebrew nation. Number one, it's written to the Hebrew nation. It's not written to the Gentile church. It's written to the Hebrew church. And what Paul is doing, starting from verse 1, chapter 1, what he is doing, he is comparing the old covenant versus the covenant of Jesus Christ. And he's going through every aspect of it and declaring that the, the covenant of Jesus is superior to the old covenant. In chapter 2, he declares that Jesus is superior than the angels. In chapter 3, uh, he deals with, uh, chapter 5, he deals with the, with the priesthood. Chapter 8, he deals uh, with the sacrifices. Chapter 10, he's going a little bit deeper on the sacrifices, proving that what Jesus did is greater than the old covenant. In the Old Testament, the law required that bulls and goats be sacrificed for sin. In other words, in order not to get rid of sin, but to put a blanket over sin, to cover sin, they had to bring a bull or a lamb, a goat, depending and, and listen, depending on, on your financial status uh, uh, would determine what kind of sacrifice uh, you would bring. If you were wealthy, you brought a bull. If you were not that wealthy, you brought a lamb. If you were, uh, went down the ladder, turtle doves, then from turtle doves to fine flour, but whatever your financial status was, that's the offering that you brought. And, and the writer of Hebrews takes the most expensive, because you will figure the most expensive is the best. And says, and says, this is just the shadow. This was just the, as I stand right here, I could see my shadow there. Depending on where you're sitting, you could see uh, the shadow of you. What it's saying is all these sacrifices were basically a shadow of what Jesus was going to do. It wasn't, it wasn't the real deal, but it was just a shadow of Jesus. I 
was looking for some stuff the other day in my wallet. Here she is. Anybody know who that is? Can you see it, first of all? Who is it? It's my wife. Now, when I go out and I get to missing her, I pull it out. All right? I kiss it sometimes. Now, could you imagine coming home? And she's right there next to me and I pull it out. And still kiss it. And she's standing right here. And she's trying to get my attention. I miss my wife so much. What is this? A shadow of the real. It's a shadow of the real. I have the real right there. This is just a shadow. It's a picture. It's not real. I mean, it helps when I'm away. But when I'm at home, I should put it away. Are you following what I'm saying? Listen, all those sacrifices, that's what this first scripture is saying. All those sacrifices is a picture of Jesus. Jesus has come. You don't need that old covenant anymore because Jesus is here. Yet there's many churches still want to hold on to the picture of Jesus. And Jesus is knocking at your door. I got my picture of Jesus. I got my shadow. And you have to let it go. Put it back together for me. Now notice it says... For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices that were offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Or they can never perfect, perfect you. It says, for then would they have ceased to be offered because the worshiper once purged should have no more conscience of sin. In other words, if, this, if these sacrifices could make you perfect, then uh, you'd only have to do it one time. But the simple fact that they had to do it every year was a declaration that this old system was imperfect. And what it actually did Listen to what I'm saying. What it actually did, it didn't take, it, didn't, it did not only just cover your sin, but it also reminded you that you were sinful. It says, but in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So notice it's declaring how inferior this old covenant is because the blood of bulls and goats would only cover your sin, but they could not take it away. It was still there. Verse 4 says, For it is... Verse 5, Wherefore, when he comes into the world, now he's going to start talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but my body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the books it is written of me 
to do thy will, O God. And that you can find that actual scripture in uh, Psalms 40, verse 6 and 8. Now, this is what I want you to understand. <clears throat> because God is omniscient. Everybody know what the word omniscient means, right? Omniscient means all-knowing. Because God was omniscient. We think that while Jesus walked here on earth, Jesus was omniscient. Amen? I want you to, if you could pull up he, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And we're going to read a couple of scriptures uh, on chapter 2, verse 5. And if you could give me the amplified version. I want to read it in the amplified. Let the same attitude... And purpose and humble mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Let him be your example in humility. Verse 6. Who although being essentially one with God and in the form of God, pressing, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God God. The attributes that make God God is his omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. It says, did not think this equality with God was a thing to engage in grasp or retain, but stripped himself of the privilege and the rightful dignity so as to assume the guise of a servant slave in that he became like a man and was born a human being. Thank you. So I want you to notice it says he had the attributes, but he didn't, uh, 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 he didn't see it wrong to be stripped away from those attributes. So that means when he walked here on earth, he was not omnipresent. He could only be at one place at one time. He was not omniscient. That means he didn't know everything. And if you want more scripture, you go to Luke chapter 2 at the, the, the end of the, uh, of the chapter. It says, and he grew up in wisdom, in stature and wisdom. If he knew everything, why he had to grow up in wisdom? Amen. And he was an omni, omnipotent. He had to depend on the Holy Ghost the way we do. So listen to what I'm going to say. When Jesus read about the law and about all these killing of animals, this was Jesus' thought. Man, God must have something against bulls and goats. <laughs> God must have something against bulls. I mean, he's having them slaughtered by the thousands. Every year it was thousands of bulls and goats that they would kill, and they, they would just burn them up. He said, God, you must really hate bulls and goats. Amen. But then it dawned on him. Because look at what it says. Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, verse 7 on Hebrews, verse 7. Then said I, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. God, you must really hate bulls and goats, because, I mean, you're having them killed by the thousands, but wait a minute, wait, it just dawned on me. The heading says to Jesus. It says, all this ritual, it's talking about me. All, everything that's in the Old Testament, 
It's declaring what I'm supposed to do. Amen. I mean, they're repeating it constantly because constantly they're telling themselves what I'm supposed to come into this world and accomplish. I'm supposed to die as that bull and I'm not going to cover their sins the way the blood of bulls and goat covers their sin. I'm going to remove the sin. Go to uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 27. If you just... Uh, just to back up what I, and beginning at Moses, Jesus is now talking to the two men after they, they, he rose from the dead. They had crucified him, they killed him, and two men are walking to, on the Emmaus road, and Jesus appears to them, and they begin to talk to him. I just want to read the scripture, uh, what Jesus does. And beginning at Moses, what books are Moses' books? The first five. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the prophets, and all the prophets. That's the, the rest of the whole Old Testament. All the prophets. So Moses and the prophets make the Old Testament. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures. What? The things what? In other words, they're all talking about who? And that's what he realized. It's not that you hate bulls and goats. It's that you're talking about me. You're in a code. You're letting me know. See, because this is a secret that the devil can't know. Because Paul says, if they would have known, they would have never crucified the, the Lord of glory. If they would have known. So God, throughout the whole history of, uh, of the human race, he, he, he declared a story about Jesus and hid it in codes. And now declared it unto us that it was all about Jesus. Listen, when you read the Old Testament, you, you shouldn't be looking for rules and regulations to follow. You should be looking for Jesus. Let me say that again. When you read the Old Testament, you should not be looking for rules and regulations to follow. You should be looking for Jesus. Verse 8, above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sins thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Notice he has taken away the first, that he may establish the second. What did he take away? What is the first? The law. So he could establish what? Grace, the second. By the which will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Notice it says, through the offering of, by the which we are sanctified. Not you're going to be. Not you're going to be sanctified. But you are sanctified. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Notice, and every priest, he's still making the comparison. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take sin away. In other words, those priests from the Old Covenant, their work was never ended. They, they had to be going on and on and on so they never got it, were able to sit down. Because it was a continual work. 
And it says, yet that sacrifice could never take away sin. But this man, verse 12, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, for how long? So that means he took away the sin. That means he fulfilled what John the Baptist said about him. What did John the Baptist say about him? Anybody know? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Behold, in other words, this sacrifice, remember in chapter 1 it says it should have cleansed their, their conscience to where they would have known, hey, I've been cleared from all my sins. I don't have to worry about sin anymore. It's been taken care of. It says it didn't do it. But what it's, he's declaring here is the blood of Jesus has taken away all your sins. See, and when you're taking that communion cup, that's what you're declaring, that all my sins have been taken away. But, Pastor, you don't know what happened last night. And when you think that way, you just told me you don't know what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Amen. But pastor, what about that? I mean, I know this person. He calls himself a Christian. And every Saturday he does this. And you mentioned the, the sin. You just told me you don't know what Jesus did. Amen. Because Jesus took away all the sins of the world. He took it away. He took it away. But, but there's no but. You either believe it or you don't. You know, you're not going to tell me like uh, when I started getting into the grace message, God, uh, well, actually, let me repeat that. When I was being stubborn back in the early 80s and, and God tried to teach me a little bit of something on grace, I read a scripture that said, uh, Peter asked, how many times must I forgive my brother seven times? Jesus told him not seven times, but 70 times seven. I went and asked one. I was a young man back then. I went and asked one of my one of my pastors. I said, Pastor, this scripture says I have to forgive. Uh, uh, how many times I have to forgive my brother? And it says seventy times seven. And he goes, Oh, and he he went off. Oh yeah. If you if you have ought against somebody, it doesn't matter how many times they offend you. You have to forgive them. I said, That's not my question. I know I have to forgive them. Seventy times seven. That's, four, that's 490 times that you have to, you, you'd have to be married to the person for them to be able to offend you 490 times in one day. Because it's 490 times in a day. You have to live with the person so they can uh, be able to do it 490 times in a day. I said, I know I have to forgive him. The scripture says I have to forgive him. That's not my question. He said, what's your question? I said, can Jesus do it? Amen. Can Jesus do it? And he looked around, made sure nobody was looking. And he said, oh, oh. yeah, he can, but we can't preach it. I said, why can't we preach it? He said, because people will go wild sinning and saying, anyway, God will forgive me. He goes, do you want to be responsible for that? And I thought to myself, no, I don't. I don't want to be responsible for people going wild and sinning. 
You know, I didn't realize they were already going wild and sinning. They were just keeping it behind closed doors. <laughs> Amen. You go to any legalist church that is hammering you against sin and, and, and be, turn into a mouse and even go. I don't know if I should say it, but even go into some of those preachers homes and they're out sinning. They're just doing it like, I don't know who the one that sings. So when we get behind <laughs> To hear about spousal abuse in the ministry? They were all, we were going wild sinning. For a fact, I know I was. I'm not going to try to, I thought I, I was living a perfect life, but. Found another one that says, if any man sees a brother commit a sin that is not unto death, he will ask and he will give him life. This I say to those that do not commit the sin unto death. So I went to the director. I was going to Bible school back then. I went to the director and I said, hey, does this scripture mean what it actually says? He goes, what do you think it says? That there are sins that aren't going to take us to hell. He went and closed the door to his office, make sure nobody was listening. He said, yeah, that's what it means. He said, but we can't preach it. I said, why can't we preach it? He said, but what if the, the sin, if someone asks you, is this a sin that will take, take me to hell? And you say no. And it is the one that takes them to hell. He said, do you want that responsibility over your head? I said, uh, no, I don't want that responsibility over my head. And we didn't preach it. Refused to preach it. 2008, when I read Joseph Prince's book on destined to reign, I'm arguing with the book and say, he can't be preaching this. This is going to cause people to go wild and go sin. Amen? Listen, folks, this scripture says he took care of sin 2,000 years ago once and for all. Hallelujah. You should, not be, you should not be concerning yourself with sin. You should be concerning yourself with what Jesus did for you. He removed your sin. That's what taking that, when you take that cup, that's what you're declaring. Jesus has, has removed all my sins from, you know, uh, when it comes to drinking the cup unworthily, we used to say, if there's sin in your life, you can't take it because you're going to get sick and die. I don't know about you, but when would be the best time to remember that Jesus died to forgive me from all my sins? When would be the best time to remember that? Come on, you could tell me. When would be the best time? I need a bold person. That's when you sin. When you've just got, when you just finished committing a sin, that would be the perfect time to take bread and wine and say, Father, I thank you. I thank you. Because even though this lifestyle is wrong, your blood was shed to cleanse me from all my sins. That's the best time to take it. Yet that's when we keep it away from people. <laughs> Amen. Because remember, we are remembering that he died to take my sins away. But when they sin, we don't let them remember. We tell them, you can't take communion. Don't tell me, Don, that's good teaching right there. That's when you, you want to bring the bread and wine out and say, Jesus, thank you for your blood. Because it, it I guarantee you that if you, do it, if you do that every time you sin, you'd quit sinning.
It said it was done once and for all. It says, but this man, he has offered one sacrifice for sin, sat down at the right hand of God. You know why he sat down? The work is over. The work is over. Say with me, the work is over. The work of redemption is over. You have been redeemed. It's a done deal. You're not trying to get it. You're not trying to obtain it. It's a done deal. All you have to do is receive it. All you have to, it doesn't matter how, how sinful you, uh, you might be. It's a done, the work of redemption is a done deal. And when we take that bread, and when we take that wine, that is what we're declaring, that the, Jesus came and took all my sins away. Every single one of them. And listen, if you're ever going to sit down and rest, you're going to have to believe. Because he sat down to rest because the work was over. The work of redemption was over. If, you ever, if you're ever going to enter the rest of God, you're, you're going to have to determine within your heart that the work is over. Your redemption is a done deal. Verse 13, for henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Wherefore the Holy Ghost also is witness to us. Let me stop. For by one offering he has what? He has what? I'm on verse 14. For by one offering he has what? Perfected what? Perfected us. Forever. How long? So how long have you been perfected? So why do you still see yourself with imperfections? Why, why do you treat people as in perfect. Why do you see people as lesser than you? Because they don't pray and read their Bible as much as you do. I'm not saying that what you do is wrong. You should read and pray and have fellowship with God. See, and I'm hitting on that attitude because that was me. You know, back in the, uh, in the 80s, you didn't want to know me back in the 80s. Because I, I would walk into in a church and you could slice judgmentalism like slicing butter as soon as I walked in. Because I was looking at you with the eye of judgment. See how you were dressed, see what you had on to criticize you from the pulpit. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. You've been to those churches where you walk in and everybody turns around and they look you from head to toe. And you could just slice that they're judging you for how you look. I mean, I'd go into churches and, and, and I'm talking about going to churches where everybody, all the ladies had their skirts down to here and they're uh, up to here. Yet judgmentalism was still there. Let alone if they came in pants. And I would preach how imperfect the church was. Yet the scripture says, Pastor, but what about that scripture that talks about spots and blemishes? Read it carefully. It's not saying that the church has spots and blemishes. It's saying that Jesus took out all the spots and blemishes from the church. 
Let me say that again. Read it carefully. And that's found in, 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 uh, in, um, in Ephesians chapter 5. It's not, that scripture is not saying that the church has spots and blemishes. You know those preachers that say, oh, Jesus can't come back because the church is so full of spot and blemishes. Uh, he would have to leave half of the church. That's a lie of the devil. How dare they? This is my wife, and she is a perfect beauty to me. Now, if Daniel here were to try to, were to, try to point out some uh, defects on her, how dare you criticize and judge my wife and say she's not perfect? Are you guys getting the picture? I... I, I, I've invested so much into her to make her the perfect beauty for me. And now you are going to come and judge that she's imperfect? Don't shut me down. I'm teaching good. That scripture says that Jesus sanctified her and took out all the spots and blemishes. But now I'm going to preach that it's full of spots and blemishes. So what I'm doing is I'm criticizing the work Jesus did and saying he did a lousy job. Amen. Don't you? Can't say it. Say oh me. It's the truth. Amen. But pastor, you're going to tell me you don't see the mistakes people make? Listen, do I know people make mistakes? Yes. But I know something you don't know. Because when you ask me, you're going to tell me that means you don't know that the blood of Jesus took care of it all. Amen. Amen. And that's why he says, your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. That means, notice, I will remember no more. I want to point a little bit of something out uh, on that. Your sins and your iniquities, I will remember no more. I will. That means that's my choice. So this is what I want you to see. God is not saying he's going to forget your sins and iniquities. Because to forget means it's absent from your mind. My wife did cook breakfast for me. But if I were to say, I don't remember that she didn't cook breakfast for me. That means it's out of mind. I have no memory of it. But it says, but if I say, I won't remember, I will not remember that she didn't cook breakfast for me. That means I'm making a choice that I know she didn't cook breakfast for me, but I'm making a choice not to remember it, that she didn't do it. So what he's saying, I will remember your sins no more, is I'm making a choice not to bring them back up to memory. I know what you've done, but I know what Jesus did. And based on what Jesus did on that cross, I'm making a choice of not bringing it up to my memory again. So when you go before God and say, oh God, I know, I know I'm bad. I know, I know I'm a drunkard and I shouldn't be drinking. God said, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Why? Because he's chosen not to remember. And the reason he's chosen not to remember is because Jesus already died for it. Jesus already paid for it. So he's making a conscience. 
But when you take that bread and that cup, that's what you're saying. It is a finished work. And it includes your finances. It includes your peace. It includes your health. And every time you're taking it, you are remembering that his body. See, because his body was broken. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. His body was broken so that you could have health. And when you take that communion, that's what, that's what it means. Now to take it unworthily, real quick, like I want to touch on these two things, to take it unworthily. Number one, and I already touched a little bit on it. Let me go back to Hebrews, I mean to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11. Verse 27, it says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. Notice it's going to tell you, this next phrase is going to tell you what it means to eat it unworthily. Not discerning the Lord's body. Not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, you just take it as a ritual and don't really stop to think about what does it mean that his body was broken up for me? What does that sacrifice really mean? Because see, communion is representing the finished work of Jesus. So communion should be your declaration of all my sins have been forgiven. I am free from sin. He died to make me prosperous. He died so that I could be whole in body. You say, Pastor Eli, you mean if I take that wafer, that wafer could bring healing to me? Listen, in the Bible, there's three meals that brought, uh, changed the course of humanity. Man ate three meals. Different men ate three meals. And it changed the course of of their lives. Adam ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and it changed the whole course of humanity. All he did was take a fruit and eat it. And it brought death, sickness and disease into this body. Talk about our nation being in slavery. Talk about our nation being in slavery. They're slaves. They're beaten, they're malnutritioned, they don't eat well. Do you think there was any sick among them? Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of them sick and feeble. Yet why does Psalm says he took them out of Egypt with silver and gold and there was none sick among their tribes? Why does it declare that there was none sick among them? Yet, when we see slavery, we see people full of disease, full of sickness, feeble, beaten. Yet it says there was none sick among them. You know why? Because they took that Passover lamb. That night, they ate the lamb representing Jesus. And that night, D God just performed a miracle upon all the nation and healed them of all their diseases. That's just the picture of the real. So when you partake of that bread, you're doing what Jesus told the, the Jews in chapter 6 of John. He that does not eat my flesh and drink my blood. When you take it, you're actually with discerning the Lord's body. 
that he did it for your healing, guess what? Healing will come to your body. Now let me say this. When you don't discern it, it says, that's why there's many sick among you. In other words, you took it without believing that, he, and that's why you're still sick, because you're not believing that, that he died for you to heal you. Amen? Amen? Now there's another way. And this is not to be condemning, but to give instruction. Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. It says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In other words, what he's saying is guard your heart. Guard your heart. So what I'm going to share now is, is not so that you could feel guilty or condemned, but so that you could guard your heart. If you allow bitterness, envy, resentment, to come into your heart. Proverbs 17.22 A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken dry, dries up the bones. In other words, a broken spirit. When you're sad, when you're bitter, Angry, jealousy, resentment. It says it dries up the bones. You know the bone marrow is what gives, makes your blood and the blood is what gives you life. In other words, a broken spirit makes you sick. You say, Pastor, what does this have to do with... Follow me. I spent a whole 50 minutes right now teaching you on how much God loves you and he's forgiving you. And the reason I've done this is because you cannot give away what you have not received. Do you know, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I used to come in and I would judge you on how sinful you were and you could slice uh, the way I used to judge you. You know why I used to be that way? You want me to tell you why? Because I thought that's what God was doing to me. I felt God was judging me and looking at me how sinful I was. So when I went to church, I felt that I had to point that out to, to, to the people. But when I started to understand how much he loved me in spite of all my failures, guess what? I began to be able to give away and express love. Amen. It regardless, I began to give away and express love. I received, when I thought I was receiving judgment from God, I was giving out judgment to people. When I thought, when I began to see that I was receiving nothing but love from God, I started to give love out to people. So I'm not going to stop. But this is what happens. Let's go to verse 17. Uh, let's go to uh, um, our opening scripture. 1 Corinthians. Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together, notice, not for the better, but for the worse. Next scripture. For first of all, when, when you come together in the church, I hear that there is be division among you and partly what? I believe it. So if you ever go to a church where there's not a little bit of strife going on, you're in a perfect church. Don't go. 
Why? Once you get there, it's going to be imperfect. Notice what Paul says. Verse 19. For there must be also heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. In other words, what Paul is saying is, you know, uh, I hear that there's uh, divisions among you. You know, uh, and partly I believe it. He said, but you know, there has to be. There has to be. Why? Why? Because this way, you'll know if you've been approved. This way, you'll know where you stand. If you've really, if you've really have gotten a hold of this love walk, of this love message. See, if I'm teaching a lot of love, and no one ever provokes me to anger... How am I going to demonstrate that, hey, I've got it? Let me give you, let me, let me. If I'm preaching love, and then Daniel does something to provoke me, and I go slap him around a couple of times, did I pass the test on love? Amen. No, I didn't pass the test. So that's what Paul is. Uh, that is Paul. Uh, what, uh, if I if I'm declaring that I've received God's love and now I gotta share God's love, okay? L- let me s- send you a little test. And now that uh, I I I lose the whole control of it. Guess what? That means I gotta hear more about God's love. I got to receive more of it for me. Why? Because I, could, I, I was not able to express it to Daniel when he provoked me. Are you following me? So basically is, yeah, th- these problems have to come. These problems have to come so that... Hey, have you grown in this message? And how are you reacting with that brother that seems to rub you the, the wrong way? Any of you have a brother that rubs you the wrong way besides me? How do you react to him? How do you deal with him? <laughs> Amen. Do you avoid him? <laughs> oh, I walk in love, but if, if he's coming down the aisle, I go there on the other aisle. Well, you're not passing the test. <laughs> Amen. That means, that means I got to preach a hundred more times. Jesus loves you unconditionally. Irregardless that you might say, again, he's again on that same subject. Yeah, because you're still walking around the other aisle to avoid that brother. You still haven't got it because you haven't, you're not giving it away. Amen. Amen. Now notice. But now God has... Did I lose my spot? Yes, I did. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not eating the Lord's Supper. For in eating, everyone taketh before his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? What? Have you not houses to eat or to drink, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I will not. 
In other words, in discerning the, because it says discerning the Lord's body. Bible declares that he is the head and we are what? Am I discerning, remind me your name, I'm sorry. Am I, am I discerning that Richard is part of the body? And that even though I might not agree with him completely in everything that he does, he's still part of my body. Amen. Can I still give him love in spite that we don't agree in every area? Can I still give Daniel love in spite of the fact that he does things to irritate me? <laughs> See, that's, that's part of discerning the Lord's body. You know, uh, can I, I've received this awesome love. Can I give it away to those that come in and don't have the proper odor? Can I give them a hug and make them feel welcome as part of the Lord's body? Because we're talking about discerning. And see, and when you get full of uh, uh, envy, when you get full of resentment, you can't give the love that he's given to you. You can't give it away because you, you forgot to guard your heart and you've allowed envy and resentment and strife to come in. And listen, it's not because God is judging you. It's because the Bible declares that those things will kill you.